Well, good morning, Southside. Welcome. Welcome. Special welcome to any guests that we have. We're grateful you've come to worship with us this morning, and I wanted to wish all our moms a happy Mother's Day. I just am grateful for mine and all that she did in my life, and it's been a, a joy to have a, a mom like her, and I know many of you are so blessed and thankful, and as a pastor, I know sometimes Mother's Day also brings pain and hurt for loss of children and um, abusive mothers and some of the things that you've endured and just want you to know that, uh, again, Christ is sufficient and we keep looking to Him for all things, but just know that we care about all the, all the weights that are represented here this morning. And so we preach Christ, the, the comforter of souls, and so we will look again at Him this morning. Well, if you'll uh, open to Romans chapter 9... Last week, uh, we finished it up, and I, I think I told you we were done, but I just this week, I was like, no, we, we're not done. I, I want to pull out and just catch our breath from Romans chapter 9 and make some application this morning. We're, we're such a hurried generation. We love sound bites and short and quick that we, we need to learn how to linger on deep and profound truths like have been set before us in the last couple of months. And so I, I would like to just linger on uh, Romans 9 and make some specific application uh, to our hearts this morning. So let's, let's go to our Father in heaven and ask him to meet us in our time. Father, we rejoice that we get to continue now worshiping in the word of God. And I pray that every heart in here would worship the sovereign one who shows mercy on sinners. And so God, let our hearts be full and now as we seek to keep driving this down into the day-to-day -day specifics of how to live to our God, I pray that you would meet us this morning. Lord, let every, every believing heart here understand this and find that beautiful rest, that rest of just surrendering everything into your hands that are good and they're safe. And God, let that be the fruit of every heart. And I just pray for any unbelievers in our midst. I, I desire that the, the God of the universe would be their father by the end of this service. And so God, meet us and do only what you can do, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I, what I want to do then is I want to look, we've been talking about God's purpose in Romans 9, and it first kind of came in Romans 8, 28, that we know that God causes all things to work for good. Um, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then in verse 29 of Romans 8, we looked at what that purpose was. And the purpose of God is he foreknew us, he predestined us to adoption as sons, he called us, he justified us, and he's glorified us. And so he is moving all things to this glorification where we're going to be made perfectly into the image of Jesus Christ. So he has a purpose. And then Paul started working on this argument in Romans 9. Oh, yeah, well, if that purpose can't fail, what about Israel? And we saw this beautiful argument that Paul did in Romans 9, 6. He began by saying, not all Israel is Israel. God has always had a purpose in history, and it was never to save all of Israel. We'll see in Romans 11 till the end. We see this very clear purpose of God and his purpose was to, to save a remnant from Israel. Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And as we closed out that section, we saw his purpose was to save a remnant of Jews and a remnant of Gentiles from all walks of life, all peoples, all the way back to Genesis 12, God promised in a seed who would save the nations and the remnant of the Jews. And so God's purpose has not failed and it cannot fail. The devil Man's free will, circumstances cannot thwart the will of God. Jehovah reigneth. Job 42, 2, I know that thou, God, canst do all things and that no purpose of thine can be thwarted. Nothing can stop it. And so what I want to get from Romans 9 is that God then has a very specific purpose in this world for why he created it. History is his story it's the unfolding of his purpose moment by moment. And you get these macro uh, pictures in the Bible of the big picture of what God's doing and how he's working. And then you get this little micro pictures of every detail of my life 
has been decreed by God. And so he has a purpose and he has decreed our lives. And he's decreed them in perfect wisdom and goodness and immutability. He doesn't change. And so every day is the unfolding of God's will in your life. And as Christians, this is one of the, one of the biggest foundations of our lives that we need to understand and get into our hearts is that our God is sovereign and he's sovereign over all. And he does have a plan for you, for this world, and he does have a purpose and he has a will. And we have to get that his purpose is our conformity to Christ so that people like us from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be presented to Christ as a perfect bride at the marriage supper of the Lamb at the close of history. And so it is amazing what God's plan is. And to be brought into that plan and his purpose and, and that our little daily lives, every detail now matters. And it has a purpose from God in the fulfillment of his big purpose. So you've been brought into an amazing purpose of God. And now being brought into that, all of our details matter in working out this big picture. So nothing in your life is not ordered to this, uh, is ordered to this aim of the glory of God. It, it, this is the key to glorifying God in our lives Thy will be done every day. Thy will be done. Nothing comes into your life, not from his hand, for the purpose of conforming you into the image of Christ for his glory. And so we need this for life and godliness. And Romans 9 just put this on display that it's not just an election chapter. It's a chapter that God's showing his glory. And, and now our whole lives have been brought in for that glory. We exist to, to exalt God and to put his glory on display by being vessels of mercy and being changed and conformed into that image. So why do I bring all that up? You're like, you've been bringing it up a lot, Pastor. <laughs> okay, why do I bring it all up? I'm not done yet. What I just said is Orthodox Christianity. Westminster Confession, Baptist Confession, London Confessions, etc., etc. This, this is what was taught and declared by the church of God uh, for thousands of years. My burden is that a large group in the church has abandoned such truth. It, it is almost becoming extinct in the, own, the country that we live in. God on his throne has become hated. We like man on the throne. And so what I would like to do is make application then the first thing to look at is there, there's a new theology that started springing up when I was in seminary back in the 90s, and it's just been gaining momentum, and most people don't even know uh, its name or its movement, they've just taken on its thought. And, then, and it's taught in universities and seminaries, and it's this thing called open theism. And open theism, what it teaches, I don't usually take on uh, a lot of false teaching. I, I was taught, you know, when you're a banker, they teach you to know what money feels like and looks like to where you get so good at knowing it, you can spot the false. And so really one of our great passions at Southside is to show you the gospel of Jesus Christ to where you know it so well, you can spot the false. But this morning, I wanted to tackle something that is just false teaching, and I think it's important for us in our journey. And so open theism teaches that God knows the past, he knows the present, but God does not know the future. The future is not known to God in this teaching. God can't know the future because he cannot know what man, being free moral agents, will choose to do. So he, he never knows what's going to happen in the future because you're just free moral agents. I don't know what you're going to do. And because he knows man so well, he many times can predict what they most likely will do, um, and there's times where he could be wrong. But God is amazing, they say, and he can take all of these free actions of men and work them to bring about a good end because he's God. And so God does not know the future. He took a great risk in creating, but it was worth it to him. And Adam and Eve, it, it, it got away. It, they, they sinned and took us into destruction. So God is, is working with that. He's changing his mind to his purposes. He has regrets for his past actions. He listens to men and learns from them and changes how he'll deal with things. And so often we'll say, if I had only known, and they would ascribe that to be true of God. And so the great problem 
is will history move in the direction that God hopes that it will? And so are God's promises sure? Um, I would have to say no. But the only way for man to have true human freedom is if the future is open. So we're back to this idol of human freedom. So there, if we don't give man uh, human freedom, then, then God can't be God. So if we, if we say man has this freedom, they're, they're, they're the ones who determine their destinies and what we do, then God can't be sovereign. And so that's what they're trying. This whole teaching has come out of that thought, that mindset. And it's in 1994, Clark Pinnock and others authored a book called The Openness of God, a biblical challenge to the traditional understanding of God. And so right there should make you nervous when you hear that out of the gate. A biblical challenge to the traditional understanding of God. And it truly took this view from the backstage to the spotlight. And I'm just going to read a little paragraph to let you hear how they described it so it's not in my words. <coughs> in this book... We are advancing the open view of God, and our understanding of the Scripture leads us to depict God, the sovereign creator, as voluntarily bringing into existence a world with significantly free personal agents uh, in it, and the agents who can respond positively to God or reject His plans for them. In line with the decision to make this kind of a world, God rules in such a way as to uphold the created structures and because he gives liberty to his creatures, he's happy to accept the future as open, not closed, and a relationship with the world that's dynamic and not static. We believe that the Bible presents an open view of God as living and active, involved in history, relating to us, and changing in relation to us. And so we see the universe as a context in which there are real choices, alternatives, and surprises. God's openness means that God is open to the changing realities of history, that God cares about us and lets, us, lets what we do impact him. Our lives make a difference to God. They are truly significant. God is delighted when we trust in him and saddened when we rebel against him. God made us significant creatures and treats us as such. And so this is making man the sole determiner of his destiny and truly the whole earth and all of history. And so this is big to me because what it does is it chops at the knees the whole Bible, my hope, my trust, and the very heart of how I do ministry. And so calamity and suffering are not from God. They're because we're free moral agents and because the devil is, has a power. And so we, we walk through life, not, we don't have to blame God for anything that comes into our lives. And so it, you can just always say, hey, the reason that happened is because people are bad. And the reason your life is this way is because it's the devil. And you can spend all your days looking at that. But how do you teach people to live radical lives trusting in the sovereignty of God, that God is God? How do you deal with fear? <laughs> I can't control man. I can't control the devil. How do I get up and enter into this world? How do I not have anxiety? How am I not angry? How am I not bitter? Prayer is better off trying to change men's will than God's. Instead of how can God help us, how can we help God? And what will become of our worship, a mighty fortress, is our God. I meet and counsel people on a daily basis that don't know the foundation and hope that we just spent months on and Romans, and you can't get a Romans 8 confidence with this kind of thinking that was just described. The suffering and what you're telling me. With this view, the success of God's purposes rests in other people's hands, and it's his will is resisted by billions. And not even God knows if his purpose will ever be fulfilled but he's using all of his attributes to try to keep this train from jumping the track. And that's what they say is a high view of God. And so how well is God doing in that view? The theft, the murder, the rape, the adultery, Ukraine, suffering and disease, and how many people today are rejecting God? For the most part, God has failed to steer the world forward in his ways in this view. And why? So man can be self-autonomous. 
It's such an idolatry. We've we got to have man being self-autonomous. And the church needs to see God on his throne. And I'm begging you to be a church that worships at a sovereign throne, a God who sits enthroned accomplishing all of his purposes. No purpose of thine can be thwarted. And this is not small, it's cruel to leave them sitting in false teaching like this because I've counseled it. And when you don't have a God who you can look to and trust and go to, you're done. You're done when hardship comes. And so what I want to do is show you that all the scriptures that clearly show a sovereign God who knows the future because he's decreed the future. And the problem uh, is time. <laughs> so I'm going to summarize. Just turn to Isaiah. We're just going to look at a few verses. I, I'm going to point you to a resource where you can look at hundreds of verses. But first, there was a guy named Steve Roy, who was a doctrinal student and faculty member at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And here's his summary in his doctorate dissertation. He said, there's 164 texts in the Bible that explicitly teach or affirm God's foreknowledge. 271 texts that explicitly teach and affirm other aspects of God's omniscience, that he knows all things. 128 texts to offer predictions of what God will do through nature. 1,893 texts that state predictively that God will do something or other uh, in the future through human beings. 1,474 texts that predictively state what human beings will do apart uh, from God directly acting in or through them. 622 texts state predictively that unbelievers, what they will do or what they happen, will happen to them. 143 texts that affirm God's sovereign control over human choices, and, and it goes on. And I think what we'll do then is we'll just look at these verses in Isaiah. So let's go first to Isaiah 41. And I, I want you to stay with me, keep tracking, and I'm going to give you the best Mother's Day present you've ever had, okay? You're sitting there going, this is ridiculous on Mother's Day. It's going somewhere, I promise you. I promise you. Moms, these things matter, man. You want to be a good mom, you learn the decreed will of God and his perceptive will and all of these sovereign things you need to be a good mother. So Isaiah 41, let's go to verse 21. The Holy One of Israel has created this universe, and he says, present your case, the Lord says. Bring forward your strong arguments, the King of Jacob says. Let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place, as the former events declare what they were, that we may consider them and know their outcome or announce to us what is coming. So declare the things that are going to come afterward, that we may know that you are God's. Indeed, do good or evil that we may anxiously look about us and fear together. Behold, you are of no account and your work amounts to nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. I have aroused one from the north and he has come. From the rising of the sun he will call on my name and he will come upon rulers as upon mortar, even as the potter treads clay, who has declared this from the beginning that we might know or from former times that we may say, he's right. Surely there was one who declared. Surely there was one who proclaimed. Surely there was one who heard your words. Formerly I said to Zion, behold, here they are. And to Jerusalem, I will give a messenger of good news. But when I look, there's no one. And there's no counselor among them who, if I ask, can give an answer. Behold, all of them are false. Their works are worthless. Their molten images are wind and emptiness. So in verse 24, though, uh, those who don't know the future, he says, are false gods. So if you wanted to find a false god, they can't predict anything. They don't know the future. And we're now taking this view saying God doesn't know the future. And he's saying that's a false god. Verse 29, how serious it is to claim that God does not know the future. Look to chapter 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. 
I will tell you the future because I'm God. Isaiah 43, look at verse 8. <clears throat> Here's Israel being God's witness. He says, bring out the people who are blind, even though they have eyes, and the deaf, even though they have ears. All the nations have gathered together so that the peoples may be assembled. Who among them can declare this and proclaim to us the former things? Let them present their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I'm he, I'm God. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there's no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed and there was no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Even from eternity, I am he, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? Thank you. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I'm the first and I'm the last, and there's no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it and to you declared it? And you're my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Or is there any other rock? I know of none. None other can tell you the future and declare it to you. I am God, and I am God alone. Now flip over to chapter 44, verse 24. And we'll only do two more, and then I'm going to lead you to a book to spend the rest of the day on it if you want. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone, causing the omens of boasters to fail, making fools out of diviners trying to predict the future, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge into foolishness, confirming the word of his servant and performing the purpose of his messengers. It is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up her ruins again. It is I who says the depth of the sea, be dried up, and I will make your rivers dry. It is I who says of Cyrus, uh, years, hundreds of years before he's born, I'll, I'll say of Cyrus, he's my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple, your foundation will be valid. So God gives the name of Cyrus 200 years before his parents did. God will not only rebuild Jerusalem, but he'll also use a pagan king, king who will perform all of his desire. And then my favorite one, Isaiah 46, verse 8. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there's no one like me. Well, what is it, what is it be, to be like God? What is it? I declare the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. I'll call a bird or prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken. Truly I will bring it to pass. I've planned it. And surely, I will do it. I'm over the past, present, and the future because I'm God. And conclusion is God's authenticating sign of his deity is the reality and truthfulness of his foreknowledge and his predetermining of history. Psalm 139, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thoughts from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down, and you're intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Genesis 50, 20, 
Joseph says that you meant it for evil to his brothers, uh, but God meant it for good. He didn't respond to it. God declared it and decreed it. Peter, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. In the Old Testament, a prophet who claimed to prophesy from God and was wrong was killed. Open theism, God would have to be killed. And I want you to hear the book. Uh, I think the best book I've read on this subject was by Bruce Ware, God's Lesser Glory, and here's what he said. And with joy and gladness, we affirm afresh that the true and living God reigns supreme as king over all. Knowing the end from the beginning and regulating the affairs of all creation to accomplish his infallibility, wise and perfect will. As such, he's infinitely worthy of our worship and our trust. His word and promises are absolutely reliable. He is for us our sure and constant source of all that we need, so that a supreme giver of every good and perfect gift, he alone may receive all the glory that is due his name. Romans 9. The true and living God, the God of the Bible, is incomparably wise and great, and in him we are immeasurably blessed. In his infinite glory we find our everlasting good. He truly is for all who believe in him alone, their maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. To God be the glory indeed, he says. So what does that mean to me practically? Um, I'm sitting here as a mom. Thank you, pastor. What does this mean practically? And I want to give you, I'm going to give it to you as clear as I know how. The leaders of this open theism said when an individual inflicts pain upon another, one should not go looking for the purpose of God in that event. Christians frequently speak of the purpose of God in the midst of tragedy inflicted by someone else. But this I regard to simply be a piously confused way of thinking. Try to find comfort in that. But the God that we've seen in Romans is a sovereign God with a purpose who's working all things together for good. These these present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed. This is a rock, and I want you to build your lives on that. And I remember 20 years ago hearing about a, a funeral service that drove this home in my heart, and I have treasured this and have lived upon the truth that was expressed in that funeral. And I'm just going to bring you into that memorial service this morning again. A couple decades back, there was a boat plane that was flying over the Peruvian jungle. It was Veronica Bowers, seven-month-old charity. Their little girl was in her lap. And Kevin Donaldson was at the stick. And they had a six-year-old son named Corey, and the husband, Jim Bowers, was on the plane. And the Peruvian Air Force mistook the plane for a drug plane, and they opened fire on it. And the pilot's legs were riddled with bullets, and it put the plane into an emergency dive. And this man was bleeding profusely, and he lands the the plane uh, on a river. And as it begins to sink, Jim and his son pull out dead Veronica and Charity from the plane. And both had been shot with the same bullet. It went through one and into the other. Jesus said, therefore, do not fear them, for there's nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell, are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of those little birds will fall to the ground apart from your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore, do not fear. You're more value than many sparrows. And Jim Bowers got up at Fort Port, Michigan, Calvary Church in front of 1,200 people at the memorial service for his wife and his daughter. And he stood and he addressed the audience. And he said, most of all, I want to thank my God. He's a sovereign God. And I'm just finding that out more now. Could this really be God's plan for Ronnie and Charity? Could this be the plan for Corey and me and our family? I would like to tell you why I believe so. 
why I'm coming to believe so. And then he gives a list, a long list of circumstances that flowed from it and led into it and were in the midst of this tragedy. He said, Ronnie and Charity were instantly killed by the same bullet. Would you say that's a stray bullet? And it didn't reach Kevin, the pilot, who was right in front of Charity. It stayed in Charity. And he said one of my favorite phrases in ministry, that was a sovereign bullet. The article was written by Mr. Donaldson, who writes for the Washington Post, and it was quoted with great cynicism. And he felt what an awful thing to say. And then he forgave the shooters. He said, how can I not forgive them when God has forgiven me so much? Those people who did that simply were used by God, whether you want to believe that or not, I believe it. They were used by God to accomplish his purpose so that this may be similar to the Roman soldiers whom God used to put Christ on the cross. That might cause some of you to struggle. It's a sovereign bullet, he said. And at the memorial service, Steve Saint stood up to speak after, and he was the son of Nate Saint. Nate Saint was killed in 1956 in Ecuador by the Aka Indians. He went out with the famous Jim Elliott, and they went over there to preach the gospel, and when they arrived, all five men were speared to death, and that had been, that had been 50 years ago at the time of the funeral. And Steve Saint stood up, and he was about six years old, he said, when his father was killed in Ecuador. And he looked at little Corey, and he said, Corey, my name is Steve. A long time ago, when I was about your size, I was at a meeting just like this. I was sitting down there, and I really didn't know completely what was going on. But you know, now I understand it better. A lot of the adults used a word I didn't understand then. They were using the word tragedy. But you know, now I'm kind of an old guy, and now when people come to me and say, I remember that tragedy and when it happened so long ago. And he said, I know, Corey, they're wrong. You see, my dad, who was a pilot like the man you call Uncle Kevin, and four of his really good friends had just been buried in the jungles. And my mom told me that my dad was never going to come home again. And my mom wasn't even sad, Elizabeth Elliot. Or no, I'm sorry, she's coming next, Nate Saint. So I said, where did dad go? And he said, she said he went to live with Jesus. And you know, that's where my mom and dad had told me all my life, that's where we all want to go, that's where we all want to live. And I thought, isn't it great that daddy got to go sooner than the rest of us? And you know what? Now when people say that that was a tragedy, I know they were wrong. And he looked up from the little boy to the 1,200 adults, and he told them the difference between the unbelieving world and the follower of Jesus. He said, for them, the pain is fundamental and the joy is superficial because it won't last. But for us, the pain is superficial and the joy is fundamental. That's a rock. And that's what we're fighting and wrestling for in Romans. It's not just theology. This is foundational for the Christian life. Could you stand at your wife and little baby's funeral and say that was a sovereign bullet with the peace that that man had? This is where the rubber meets the road. Do you believe in a sovereign God who has a purpose for your life and a sparrow can't fall to the ground without him noticing how much more you who have more value that Jesus gave his life for you? Every detail of your life is wrapped in his decree and his purpose for your life. And man, there's been a lot of suffering. Divorce, with children, physical pain, job struggles, finances, depression, death. And I just want to ask you this morning, are they sovereign bullets from God? Or is it people that I'm looking at and blaming a doctor who got it wrong? A devil? Are all of these things from God to make you to G into the image of Jesus Christ like he said? Do you believe that? That's the application to Romans 9. Every detail with the Jews was working perfectly according to God's purpose. 
in every detail with the Gentiles is working perfectly according to God's purpose. He is unfolding his will in this world and in my life. And I want to close with one last testimony at that memorial service. Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth Elliott, read a poem at the end of all the statements that she made, and it's one of my favorite poems. I've quoted it often. She said, I stood a mendicant, which means a beggar of God, before his royal throne, and I begged him for one priceless gift, which I could call my own. I took the gift from out of his hand, but as I would depart, I cried, but Lord, this is a thorn, and it's pierced my heart. This is a strange and hurtful gift which thou has given me. He said, my child, I give good gifts, and I gave my best to thee. I took it home, and though at first the cruel thorn hurt sore, but as long years passed, I learned at last to love it more and more. I learned he never gives a thorn without this added grace. He takes the thorn to pin aside the veil which hides his lovely face. Jim Bowers was seeing something of that face at that memorial service of the glory of God. Paul said, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. So if it takes a thorn, frustration, disappointments, heartaches, pain, calamity, waiting, cancer, vacations that you saved for for a long time, ruined. Friends who want to be married and have to find God's purpose in trusting God. A brother who went to prison before he was saved and it's affected the rest of his life with jobs. MS, breast cancer, there's just so many, so many thorns. And this is saying, if it takes that to pin back the veil so I can see more of the glory of Jesus Christ, pin it, Lord. Just pin it. For Mother's Day, I thought long and hard about this. This is, this is your calling, moms. Not to try to find all your fulfillment in that little baby that you're holding this morning. To have someone finally love you, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> it's a very conditional love. This is it. And I want to give honor to my sweet little wife. I watched her wrestle in the scriptures for this view of God that I just described. And at seminary, when we were being taught it, she did not like it. She was a beautiful, flaming Arminian. <laughs> and I, I loved her to pieces. And we sat with one of my professors in a room with all these charts. It was beautiful watching them go through the whole thing. And she finally just said, if that's what the Bible says, I, I surrender. And I watched her become a rock and not question God and trust him in his ways, and fight her unbelief, and just teach her children again and again. She never grew weary. You can trust God. So what we're learning here this morning, I, I can teach my kids, not a fear of the devil and other people. I can teach my kids. There's a God who you can trust in every high and stormy gale. And when, when the, I'll skip too much for me this morning. She has received many sovereign bullets, and she's shown her kids the God who is worthy of complete trust. And she gave her children a vision of God who can be trusted and surrendered in. Absolutely. That his purposes are all good and will rain blessings on your head of that veil being pinned back, and you'll see more of his glory. 
So moms, I need you to get Romans 9. I need you to understand a sovereign God who surrenders your children at birth to him. Put them on the altar. Surrender them to God. God, he's, he or she's yours. Give them to the sovereign God. It's the only way you can parent without freedom and fear. And here's free, this is the answer for it. God is sovereign and good, kind, and I can just give my kids to him. He's a God who has created a world to have all his other attributes to show mercy. I, I just trust him. I love his mercy. And so I have a sovereign God that I need to understand and teach my children again and again. And then we saw last week, I need human responsibility. I need to teach them and pray and model and love and show them a God who can be trusted. Teach them Romans. Teach them that there, there's a righteousness that cannot attain to God on your own. Don't, don't let them think the world's bad and I'm good. Teach them they, they don't have any righteousness before God. Train them that there's, there's a faith that's the only way to get to God. Here's your human responsibility. Lead them to Jesus Christ. Show them they're not righteous. Moms need to be theologians. I'm really big on that. Learn the word of God. Understand it. Teach these kids. Show them this. I love what Paul said to Timothy. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom, Timothy, you learned them. Where'd you learn them? The elders? Note from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so here it is. All you've had is the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, your, your mother and grandmother have shown you Jesus Christ in the gospel. They, they knew, they, they had a redemptive view of the whole Bible and they were teaching the scriptures to Timothy. That's where you learned the gospel, Timothy. Hallelujah, mothers, grandmothers, grandmothers, pour it into them. Show them Jesus Christ from every page of the Bible. And so I just want moms to, to be theologians and trust God and sovereign bullets and lead your kids to that and lead them to away from their own hands of righteousness and to Jesus Christ. All right. Those who aren't moms, I got stuff for you. This is... Go back to Romans. Get out of Isaiah. Isaiah is Romans in the Old Testament, I think. And this is what I want to walk away with as I've been meditating on Romans for my own heart. I'm running out of time, so I'll try to move quickly. Paul says in Romans 9.1, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. What is it, Paul? For I could wish that I myself were accursed, damned, separated from Christ for the sake of my Jewish brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Romans 10.1, these are our book ending, our election chapter. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. He's telling you what's going on in redemptive history and I just, I would be damned if they could be saved. My heart's desires, I want their salvation. Uh, look at 1014. How, how then are people going to call on Jesus in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him who they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they're not sent? Just as is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Take the gospel Go proclaim it. Pray for their souls. Have compassion for the lost. If, if Romans 9 didn't lead you to see that there's a God who has mercy and he does it through this gospel and I, I hurt for the lost, I pray for them, I care about them. We send preachers, I go preach. We all go tell this. This, this is what sovereignty should produce, not just, oh, God's sovereign. Hope they get saved. Stop. Get a heart. This should draw you to say there's a God who saves. There's a God who shows mercy through this gospel. I'm going to give every day I have to, to, to spread this and tell them and let them know God uses this gospel to save. Let that grab your heart. You, he's praying. Why pray if God's sovereign? Why, why pray if he's not? 
That's a simple answer, isn't it? Create that in every heart here this morning, God, that we would have fellowship in this gospel and spread it to all men and all peoples. That should be our, what we're united together on. It's a gospel for all. In Romans 10, 9 through 13, I'll, just, I'll send you to read these on your own. Jew and Gentiles now are brought together in Christ. I, I don't care what your end times theology is. Do not separate what God has joined together. And the, this, this climactic event of Jew and Gentiles with the, the wall breaking down, and now we have this promise that was made to Abraham of believing in the seed and being reconciled to God by faith, and we all have faith. Do not miss the unity of Jew and Gentile believing in Jesus Christ being one body now. Please don't miss the glory and the beauty of that. Romans 9.33 says you're not going to be disappointed if you believe in Jesus. Romans 10.11, all who call upon the Lord will not be disappointed. And I just want to remind you again as we come out of Romans, the one who believes in Jesus Christ will never be disappointed. But this gospel is truly the center reference point of your life. It's then what drives everything. It's, it's your chief end. This is your chief end. In 1987, I was saved at the Billy Graham crusade, and ever since then, th this is it. I just want to know this gospel. I want to believe it. I want to live into it. I want to spread it, and I want to establish it in other people. That's it. Is that what the gospel has done in your heart? I pray. We come out of Romans with such beauty of this glory of God is put on display by this gospel. Proclaiming it, believing it, trusting it, and living into it. And lastly, if you're here and you are not saved, I just have been blown away. God made this world with one primary goal, to put on display His mercy. His mercy by forgiving our sins all his attributes serve that purpose. There's, there's even a hell to serve the purpose, to show you what you can be forgiven of and delivered from here this morning. This offer is to forgive all of your sins because he didn't forgive those sins when they were put on his son. He pulled out his sword of justice and he pierced his own son through with the sword of justice. He, he didn't forgive his son so he could forgive you of your sins this morning. If you'll repent... And turn to God and believe in Jesus Christ. It's a free offer. It's not go journey to Jerusalem and make sacrifices and work in the law and change bad behaviors. That is not the gospel. The gospel has come with an empty hand, nothing that you can do, nothing you are, and believe in Jesus Christ and what he has done. God wants to be glorified by giving you mercy as you call upon Jesus Christ. Don't waste your life on anything else but coming to Jesus Christ and surrendering to him. So Southside, may we never forget what's so amazing about grace. And Romans 9 has just lifted my heart in the beautiful grace of God. And I want us to be a people who trust sovereign bullets and help each other trust God in the hardest times and know that he's using everything to conform me to the image of Christ and that purpose can't be thwarted. There's nothing in your life, believer, right now, no matter what it is, that is not the will of God to make you look like Jesus Christ. Why am I suffering? To be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And so anything you've walked in here with is God saying, oh, I want to pin that veil back and show you more of my glory. Not to make you miserable and just destroy you. Please, believe. Let's help each other believe what God has said to be true. So let me close in prayer. Father, I thank you for Romans 9. I thank you for these dear moms. I pray, God, that you infuse in them this high calling to lead kids to Jesus Christ, point them to him again and again, and to teach them of a God who can be trusted, a sovereign God who they can drive out fear because he loves them. God, I pray, let, let us understand sovereignty, responsibility, calling, how you bring children to, to life and faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, let, 
Let the women of this church give themselves to know this word and to learn it deeper and deeper and to pour it in to those kids. I pray, God, I pray that all of us would trust if there's a sovereign bullet sitting in our heart this morning, Lord, that you would take away bitterness, anger, frustration, anxiety, fear, with a, just a trust in a father who cares about us way more than sparrows, who's working everything for our good. Lord, let us fill our pain with faith and trust this morning. Refresh. For those who are doubting and weak and struggling, Lord, refresh, please, their faith and their hope. Lord, you're a God of hope. And I pray that you would do that in our midst this morning and that you encourage weary moms who are tired of repeating these truths and watching their kids walk away and punch each other. God, help them. Give them grace. Give them strength. Lord, and use their means as a means in those kids' lives. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.